So I had a conversation with an elderly man one day. He's since gone to be with the Lord. And he was the founder of an amazing Christian ministry that accomplished so many things and built so many things and serviced so many people. I talked with him one day. And he talked about prayer like it was a really simple thing. Like I ask God for things and, and then he, he does them. And it was just, it was a powerful conversation, but I, I walked thinking, wow, how does a person live a life like that where they ask God for things and God answers their prayers and they do things for God like that? How does, a, how does an old man come to the end of his life and, and he can talk like that? I visited his grave. I, matter of fact, I, I visited his grave with my grandson, and I told the story of his life and all the things that God used him to accomplish. I, and recently I heard a, a, an audio recording of this same man giving a testimony about all the things that God had done and all the ministries that happened and all the buildings that were built and all the people that were recruited and all the funds that were raised. And he had the neatest way of telling those stories. He went on for a half an hour telling stories about how God had answered incredible prayers. And he wasn't the speaker of the hour because in his recorded talk, he kept saying, we're going to get to our speaker here in a minute. But then he went on telling these stories. You can tell just by listening to the recording that he had the attention of everyone in the room as he recounted the goodness of God and how God had answered these prayers. Then he got to the, almost to the very end of his talk, and he quoted this verse in John 15, 7. If, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, aside from the question about why one little boy goes fishing and he catches a fish when he prays, and another little Christian boy goes fishing and he doesn't catch a fish when he prays, can we just say this based on that passage? When a person abides in the Lord and his words abide in them, he can expect to have remarkable answers to prayer. So I got this uh, little story that came in yesterday Sam and Elaine, thank you for being with us. Sam, did you get a turkey this week? Elaine, did you get a turkey this week? Let's give him a hand. That's like, <laughs> congratulations. I thought, I thought I saw that. I, both of you, that's kind of humorous. A husband and wife out there killing animals. Um, birds. So that's, you guys are seasoned uh, sport. I got this uh, letter. Can I read it to you? Yeah. Did somebody say no? Who said no? Was that you, Eddie? John? I got elders helping me out here. Thanks, guys. <laughs> what would happen if we just said no? <laughs> uh, the, the eyes have it. Okay. Um, I, this is from my oldest son, Kyle, who's a pastor up in Rapids. And Leland, that he refers to, is one of our grandsons. Adorable little 10-year-old with blue eyes and long blonde hair. He's an adorable, sweet little kid. I wake Leland up at 5 a.m. We make coffee, and we get in the truck, and we make our way to the woods. Unload our gear, and with coffees in hand, we make long walk to our spot. When we get to the edge of the woods, we use the crow call I borrowed from a friend. Turkeys gobble back right away. They're close. I sat in the doorway from another man 20 feet in front of the building. If a turkey comes in, we have a good spot. I feel very exposed. We have no camo, screen, or blind. As the sun rises, we don't hear or see any turkeys. He goes on a little bit more. We walk back to our original spot, and we try to practice patience. I give the crow call to Leland, blows two sharp calls, a tom. Blood begins to flow quickly in our veins. Leland's eyes are wide. We wait 10 minutes. There's a long story here that I would love to read to you, but in the end what happens is they get their turkey. <laughs> and so he says, he says this, um, we're both feeling the same way. We start over to where the, tier, where the, we get up and we move toward the turkey. And as we walk, we're laughing and almost crying happy tears. We hug. We stand over him, admiring him, iridescent purple and brown and black colors gleaming in the morning sun. We're both feeling the same way, but Leland says, I'm happy 
and a little sad at the same time. I take the opportunity to explain this is exactly how you should feel. God placed respect in our hearts for his creation. We should feel a sense of sober responsibility whenever we harvest one of the animals he created. I tell him that we'll eat the meat this turkey gives and that our state is a process to manage the population of turkeys and we're taking part in that process. We kneel to the, next to the turkey and we say a short prayer of thanksgiving for allowing us to have this experience together and for the life of this turkey. Then we take a few pictures to capture the moment and we begin packing our gear. On the way to the truck, on the way home, we give each other fist bumps and we, re we relive the entire morning a few times. And that's when Leland says, Dad, that was a miracle. We didn't think we were going to get a turkey, but God brought him in when we prayed, just like we asked him to. He's right. It was a miracle. Kyle went on to say they got the truck stuck, and they prayed again, and then they got out, and Leland said, it's another miracle. How does an old man learn to pray and to have God's word abide in him? How does a little boy learn to pray and have God's words abide in him? And what would happen in your life? What would happen in your family? What would, what would happen like in your life that you've, you've always wanted to happen but, but didn't think it ever would if God's word abided in you and you asked what you wanted and he gave it to you? Now that's something to think about. That's what we're going to talk about. Here's what's happening in the month of May. I'm calling today kind of May because it's almost May. So today and then the month of May in the pulpit at Bethel, Lord willing, I, I get to speak four times including today um next week you will hear a message from ryan clevenger dr ryan clevenger i know he was in your Awana, but he's a doctor now he spoke before and did such a good job we asked him to return he's speaking next week on the fear of the lord he told me about it it's probably something quite like you've never heard before about how to understand the fear of the lord he's one bright young man he'll be here next week and he'll be preaching that and i'm gonna be speaking to men and the next week uh, will be Mother's Day. We'll have a special gift for our mothers, and we'll continue this series with a special twist for moms. The week after that, um, Neil Veit, Neil's uh, brother-in-law, his sister's husband passed this week, and he's there ministering to the family. Neil will, will be back with us this week, but he'll be speaking that week, talking about the life that you have desired from Psalm 16. He told me about it. You'll like it. It'll be a good message. I'll be speaking that week at Barakel to men there too. And then the next two weeks after that in May, we'll go back to this series. And this series is Lies and Truth. Lies and Truth. How, what happens when God's word, the truth, abides in you, according to the testimony of the old man I talked about, and this passage, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can expect remarkable answers to prayer in your life. You can expect God to be alive and active and working in your family, in your life, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. And if you're thinking the right things, if you're asking the right questions right now, you're asking the question, what does it mean for God's word to abide in me? How can I have the experience then of God's word abiding? What does that mean? That's what we're going to, we're going to talk about that in really practical terms in the times that I get to speak uh, today and, and the, in, the, in the month of May. And you're going to want to begin, we'll go to different places in the Bible to show this because it's taught throughout the Bible. And then in the summer, we're going to go back to going verse by verse through a book of the Bible. In, through the summer, Lord willing, we'll preach all the way through the book of Daniel. But for now, we're going to skip around for a while and show you a, a theme that's all over the place in the Bible. And it really has to do with this how do you get the word, the truth, to abide in you, and what happens when you do? You know in the Ukraine, the, the Ukrainians are going around doing something tricky right now. Did you know that? Among other things, they're changing all the road signs. So if you're riding into town in a Russian tank, the road sign says, all of them say the same thing, this way to the Hague. That's where war crimes are tried. This is the direction to the war crimes trial. So one of the things people do in the military is they, they use deception in, as a military str strategy. And Satan wants to deceive us. 
And God wants us to abide in truth and for truth to abide in us. As a matter of fact, you know this. The scriptures there say, look at John 17 in your Bible. And we'll look at John 17, verses 15 through 17. John 17, 15 through 17. And the surrounding context you should read this afternoon. Jesus now, in his high priestly prayer, one of the things he says in John 17, 15, is I do not ask that you take my followers, them, out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The sanctify word is the idea of to, of, to make them separate and holy so that they would sin less and, and do righteousness more. How many of you would like that to happen to you? Like to sin less? How many of you would like your husband to sin less? Raise your hand. Yes, just kidding. Yes, just kidding. Of course, you want to sin less and obey God more. And how do you do that? Through the truth is what Jesus prayed. Sanctify them by the truth. You ought to be asking the question, how does that work? How does that work? And, and according to Jesus, he said, what does it say? You can probably finish this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And how often do we eat? Well, let's just say at least daily. I don't know about you, but I've known people that eat more than once a day. I know some of you are thinking about eating right now. Some of you are probably actually eating right now. Um, but but we, we do a lot of that. Jesus said, you don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, the, we should get God's word in us every day, or maybe even or maybe even all day, every day, or multiple times throughout the day. That's why in Psalm 1, it talks about the blessed man, the blessed man or woman, and it says, not the one that sits in the seat of the scorner or the scoffer, but the one who meditates on God's word day and night, all the time. So, so the enemy is going to try to plant things in our minds that are not altogether true. But Jesus wants us to put things in our mind that are true. Abiding, that's what it means to abide in his word. According to the Bible, Christ wants to give us life. You know the passage in, in the same context here in John in 10, it says he, Jesus came to give us abundant life. But in, back in John 8, 44, it says Satan is a liar and a murderer, and he lies to steal, kill, and destroy, and murder. So, so Jesus' desire is to give you life through truth. And Satan's desire is to destroy your life or to kill you, to murder you, by telling you things that aren't true. The quality of your spiritual life. It's going to depend on what's going through your mind, what you're thinking about. I was, I got correspondence from a camp at Pleasant Valley Bible Camp up, up north, and they, they asked me if I would speak for a men's retreat in the fall. And I corresponded a little bit, and I asked him, what, what theme would you like me to use? And I, I settled on this theme for this series and for the men's retreats about this idea of abiding. What does it mean? What does it look like to abide in truth and for truth to abide in you? And think on these things from Philippians 4, 8. Think on these things. And so I had that all written down. I had that all thought through. And I had that basic outline and I'd begun to do some work on it. And last night I got a uh, email from uh, Naomi Sponable, who I think she's actually uh, scheduled the speakers there. And she said, our theme is think on these things. I'm like, that's all right. I've already written that, so I'll be there with what I wrote before you. And I, I love it when it happens like that. And incidentally, Naomi is the sister-in-law to Ryan Clevenger, who will speak because it's a small world. But anyway, um, it's kind of neat to see that God confirmed, in my mind, God confirmed that's what he wanted me to talk about. And I feel that's what he wants me to talk about to you. And incidentally, to the guys at Bear Lake and the guys at Barakel. And so all this month in my heart, I'm going to be thinking about this. I'm going to be sharing with you all throughout the Bible what happens when a family decides they're going to keep the truth burbling in their heart, on their mind all the time, and they're going to recognize lies when they see them. And I want to give you specific examples of that. How does that work, and, and what does it look like? So think about this. Christ 
wants to give us life, and the way he does it is through what? Truth, his word. It's actually for us to actually think about God's truth and, and believe it and act on it, and that way we have life. And I think he wants us to get his truth in our brains every day. Now, if I was a young man, and I wish I was a young man again, if I was a young man, one of the things I would do, because this is what God says he will crown with success, is I would get into God's word every day and look for wisdom from God. And, and, and I'd do it in the morning. And then throughout the day, I would keep thinking about God's word. And then at night when I got in bed and maybe I would be tempted with lust or I would be tempted with anger or I would be tempted with bitterness or I would be tempted with greed. Instead, I would put a little piece of God's word in my mind and I would tumble that around. As a matter of fact, I'm an old guy and that's what I do. But if I was a young man, that's what I would do. And the Bible says for a young man, he promises that person will have good success. You can read it in Psalm 1, in Joshua 1, 8 in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 through 17. All over the Bible, he promises genuine success to people who keep God's word in their thinking and act obediently on it. So if he wants us to get up in the morning and look in his word for a life-giving word, Satan has a counterfeit. This is the, not the first time I've taught you this, but I want this to be embedded. Satan has a counterfeit for every good thing that Jesus has for you. And so he has a custom-made lie just for you. I believe this with all my heart. And he'd like to embed that lie in your mind. And he's got a lot of helpers, the world, the flesh, the devil. I mean, you help him. Other people help him. The, the secular media helps him. It's a minefield of error everywhere we go now. Things are being said that are not true. They're contrary to God's word. And if those are the things that we build our life on, Satan will destroy us. If those are the things we believe in our marriage, Satan will destroy our marriage. If that's how we decide to aim our life, we'll have our life aimed in the wrong direction, and the lies are everywhere. And the scriptures teach that. People will tell you lies about you. Even when they're not doing it on purpose, they'll say things that just really are contrary to the Bible. People will do that all the time. They'll say things, well, you owe this to yourself. Maybe not. Maybe not. That was totally wrong. You should do this. Maybe not, right? Um, you will lie to yourself. The Bible says over and over again, don't deceive yourself. So it's possible to deceive yourself. Even well-meaning people who love you will sometimes, well-meaning people will tell you things that, that aren't true. The scriptures do say that Satan himself and millions of demons are at work in the world to sow half-truths or lies into the thinking of people. The world around us is on the side of the evil one, constantly sowing lies. If you don't see that, I fear for your spiritual life. And then there are false religions and false philosophies like Colossians 2 says, they will take you captive if you don't flee from them. Now, what is repentance? But you know, the metanoia word in the Greek is a change of mind. It's like a miraculous about face, a change of mind. Are you tracking with me? So let's say you're thinking this, and this is not something that God's word says. This is something you got somewhere else. You know, I owe this indulgence to myself because people weren't nice to me. Or whatever that was, this sinful, bad thought. Uh, I, God can't use me because I'm too old. God can't use me because I'm too young. You know, whatever it is, that, that little thing, uh, when people get to know me, they're not going to like me anymore. What, what a, uh, Satan has embedded, I believe, in everybody's heart, every young girl, every young boy, every old man, every old woman, he's embedded in our hearts something that's a tasty lie, but it's not, a, not the truth. Our job is to figure out what does God say about that and speak the truth to ourselves and act on that truth. Repentance, then, is a change of mind. Get it? Repentance is when I, when I realized that what I was believing is not true and I changed my mind and believe what's true and act on it, that's metanoia. That's repentance. So what we're talking about here is repentance. Jesus came, his first word was repent. John the Baptist came, his first word was repent. Repent and believe. Change your mind. Think differently. 
This is what we're talking about. That's why it says there in Philippians 4 and 8, finally, brothers, whatever is, what's the next word? Anybody know? Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, do what? Think about these things. That's what Naomi wrote me. Think about this. Think about God's truth. Something miraculous, something powerful, something life transforming, something out of the ordinary happens when you think about, that's what that elderly man did all his life. He, he hikes onto this property when he's a young man. He doesn't have a single dime in his pocket. He believes, he abides in God and believes in God. And, and by the time he dies, there's an entire ministry that's touched every corner of the earth because he simply put truth in his mind and belief because he said, and an old man with age in his voice, he says, I remember this verse. If you abide in me and if my words abide in you, you can ask for things and I will answer you. And he asked for lots of things that God gave him. So understanding that the world is a minefield of lies, we should re- we should say like David said in Psalm 119, verse uh, 20, I'm sorry, 20, 30, 29 and 30, remove from me the way of lying because I have chosen the way of truth. This should literally happen in your life by you thinking, like set aside whatever else you're thinking about today for a minute and think about, what, do the heavy lifting of what am I thinking that's not altogether true? And what should I be thinking about? Where is there a sweet morsel of God's word that actually makes my heart and my soul sing when I read it that I should intentionally be meditating on? This is a sweet thing to do. And so uh, the understanding the world around us is a minefield of lies. We would say, like David said, in a psalm on the scripture, like I said, Psalm 119, also Psalm 19 is about God's truth in scripture. And at the end, he says what? Do you remember this? At the end of Psalm 19, when he says all these wonderful things about the Bible, he gets to the end, he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is a key thing. It's all over the Bible. What are you thinking about? Is it true? You can intentionally displace lies in your brain with truth from god's word and expect miraculous results in your life meditating on god's truth is a powerful force something really powerful happens when a christian specifically aims truth at specific lies in their life now something miraculous happens if you do that in a general way just memorize bible verses go listen to preaching put preaching on your radio on your youtube crazy stuff will happen you don't even know how it happened but it's a lot better if you're aiming very if you're targeting lies in your mind psalm 86 11 says teach me your way O lord that i may walk in your truth unite my heart to fear your name i want to walk in your truth john 8 32 Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and you know the rest of this, and the truth will set you free. My chains fell off. My chains fell off. Proverbs, that's why Proverbs 4 and 23 says, keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the very wellsprings of life. So here's what I've experienced in my own life, and that is being privileged to be raised in a home that drugged me off to church. They never drugged me. I was a year ago. Went to church for Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night a couple of times and Wednesday night and whatever else. I, would, I was under a lot of teaching, a whole lot of teaching. At home, they taught me at home too. Every day when we would eat, the Bible would come open and mom and dad would read a little bit from the Bible. While the food was on the table getting cold, they'd read a little bit from the Bible before we go to bed at night, almost every night. They'd open the Bible. When I was little, it was the Bible in pictures for little eyes. And then when I got older, it was a hurled book story of the Bible. Then when I got older, it was the Bible itself. And then the problems in my life and the sins, which were many in my life, the things in my life that I was grieved about, I began to realize the cumulative cleansing of being exposed to God's truth would sometimes help me with things in ways I couldn't explain how it happened, but I ended up making progress or growing in the lord 
But then I discovered this. Sometimes I couldn't even explain what happened, but God had moved me along or set me free or given me a, le- a measure of freedom. Then I discovered, though, if you actually know the lie that you're believing and actually do the research to find a powerful bit of truth to, to displace that lie with, it works better and faster. Am I making any sense? So if you just are generally under the word, God's going to do good things. Study the Bible. Even if you don't understand your psyche or your id or your ego or whatever the dickens is going on in your brain, even if everybody's wrong what they wrote about that, and you're completely confused and you were improperly toilet trained and your parents uh, weren't very sensitive to you and all of that stuff, still just uh, not to make fun, cleanse yourself, bathe yourself in the word, and things will happen that are good that you don't even really understand. But how much better if we actually understand what happened? So this is what we're going to do in the series. I'm going to give you examples of lies, and then I'm going to give you truth from the Bible. Not so much that those things would edify you, which I think they will, but so that you will be seasoned and practiced yourself. You, even if you're a 14-year-old girl, you can take your own Bible and say, this is what I believe. You know, what if you're a 14-year-old girl And and a huge thing that we've done in our culture is we tell girls beauty is one of the most important things there is. Maybe we say that for women in particular. Beauty is one of the most important things there is. Now, I don't want to be mean here because we're going to be in heaven together, I trust. But, but like, if that's true, then maybe, like, Corey Ten Boom isn't really ever going to amount to much of anything because she really wasn't a beauty queen. She was a very plain-looking lady. I say that carefully. Right? She, but in other words, Corey Tedman wasn't famous because she had a small waistline and because she had, because she had I, I guess I'm going to get myself in all kinds of trouble here, but, right? So, so but, but, but that's not why. But because she had the beauty of the Lord, her God, upon her, if she was here today, it would be remarkable since she's with the Lord. Guess who would be speaking? Not me. I would be sitting at her feet. I'd be clinging to every word. I would be taking notes. I'd be trembling and crying because of God's spirit was on that lady. So the truth is there's something more important than physical beauty, isn't there? So maybe you could say this is an example. Anyway, I'm going to give the examples I was planning instead of the ones I'm making up on the fly. Um, I believe if you meditate on God's word in a specific way, one lie at a time, it'll work faster, it'll work better, and you'll be better at helping other people. And that's what, how you get to freedom. If you know how it happened, it's easier to do it again. So the best way to help someone then would be to do for them and with them what you've done with yourself. So if you're a dad and you recognize lies your daughter is believing, or you recognize lies your son is believing, and you creatively help them see that. And then you help them find their way to truth. And then the lights go on in that area. That would be a great way to help somebody. Uh, The weapons of our warfare, this is, and you want to write this down, you want to know this word. This is what I tumbled over in my mind a lot. The other night, I wake up in the night, and then while I'm waiting to go back to sleep, on a good night, well, I'll put a passage of Scripture in there and just tumble it in my head. The other night, it was such a Friday night, just a sweet, or early in the morning, on Saturday morning, I guess, such a sweet experience to tumble this in my mind. I couldn't like, get, wait to talk with the elders and talk about it with the elders when we met in the morning. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion that's raised up against the knowledge of God, and we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This was Paul's apostolic strategy that he told in 2 Corinthians in chapter 10. He says, when I go into a town, when we go into a town... He says, we don't come in there with guns and swords um, we, be, because there are strongholds or wrong thinking. If you read the context, you see it's, it's false philosophies, it's wrong thinking, it's lies that people are believing. And we destroy these arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God so that we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, if God could empower a preacher to come into a town and to, do, to help people do that, what if a person cooperated with that program or said, that's what I want to do in my life every day? Every day I want to get up, I'm going to brew a cup of coffee or tea, I'm going to open my Bible, I'm going to say, tell me the truth, Lord, and expose any error that's going to, because truth will kill you, uh, lies will kill you, and truth will set you free. Lies will bind you, truth will set you free. Lies will kill you, truth will give you life. I want to have life. I want to make good decisions. I want to be wise. 
If I'm mistreating someone or doing something wrong, I want God to show me so I can obey him. If I have a blind spot that's going to cost me, I'd like to know ahead of time. I'd like God to tell me and show me. So I get up, I'm in the Word, and then I listen to something on the radio and that, that's oriented to the Word, and I get some phrase of the Scripture in my brain. And, and so you have. Let me give you some examples. Would that be good? Let me give you some examples. And we'll see a few. Um, a young woman wrestles with depression and anxiety. And then she says to herself often and to others, I just think too much. I just have thoughts in my mind all the time, invasive thoughts. I just think too much. Now, I want to humbly suggest she's probably believing a lie because we all think all the time. And the Bible, does the Bible say we should think all the time? The Bible, so, you know, the, by the way, the difference between meditation popularly in the culture, which is based kind of on Eastern meditation, and biblical meditation is this. Broadly, the wrong kind of meditation is try not to think. The right kind of meditation is think this, think truth. Christian meditation is think God's thoughts after him and say God's words after him. Speak God's truth into the lives of other people and speak God's truth into your own brain all the time. That's Christian meditation is, is mumbling God's truth to yourself. It's thinking about God's truth and speaking truth to yourself. That's what meditation is. So the answer for the young lady, according to the Bible, is don't be anxious about anything. Philippians 4, 6. Um, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, think on these, whatever is uh, of any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, or think all the time about these things. So the lie is, I think too much. The truth is, no, it's not that you think too much, it's that you think too much about things that aren't true, and you need to replace them with things that are true. What you resist will grow like weeds, what you because that's how that works. But what you replace with something else will give you uh, freedom. That's why it says meditate on God's law day and night. You can displace error with truth. So the truth is not that you think too much, but that you think the wrong things. Thinking about wrong things is harmful. Thinking about good things is powerful. So that's an example of a lie and of a truth. Here's another example. Young man is frustrated by moral failure. He's frustrated by continual moral failure in his thought life. He's frustrated by continual moral failure in his habits. He wonders if he's even a Christian because he has this moral failure. And this is this young man. And so the lie that comes to his mind is, this is just something I'm going to have to live with. I can't overcome this. I'll never have victory over this. And then that, he gives himself that excuse. But then one day, and this is based on a true story, one day he goes to a conference, and a man is giving a testimony about how he came to a new level of moral freedom that he didn't even think existed before and has maintained this for a long time. And the young man is shocked by this testimony, and he leans forward in his seat afterwards, a couple years ago, Afterward, he goes up and he says, can I get a cassette tape of this talk? Because I have never heard that you could be free from these immoral thoughts and these immoral behaviors that I've been practicing. He gets the copy of the tape and he listens to it over again and God sets him free. He calls some of his friends, true story, up in Flint where he lived. He calls some of his friends, young men, and says, come over I got something I want you to listen to. He starts a Bible study with his friends coming over and listening to this truth. What does the Bible say when I feel like there's a temptation I just can't resist anymore? Here's a, here's a passage you can tumble in your brain. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. But God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that you can endure it. So you could go to bed at night going, he will provide a way of escape. He will provide a way of escape. He will provide a way of escape. And that will become sweet to you after a while. Or a young man going through the checkout counter in his youth, 
sees a magazine. It's kind of scandalous. He really wants to look at it. And then this is the passage that he puts in his mind when he sees it. I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means after I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. Now the, the picture is less tasteful to him and the passage is sweeter to him. And he memorizes that Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and powerful. He could go to bed going, the word of God is living and powerful. I don't have to live, I don't have to have a dirty mind. I don't have to have dirty habits. I don't have to. James 1, 21, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the, the implanted word. It is able to save your soul. What if he went to bed going, the word is able to save my soul, deliver my soul? That'd be good. That'd be good. But what if a girl was tempted with lust, you know, and then she went to bed every night and she's like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What if a girl said, no guy's going to come for me, I guess I'm going to have to come. What if she went to bed going, the Lord is my shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him till I die. No matter what happens, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. She would have life. She would have radiance about her. She would have spiritual something going on. She would have answers to prayer. It, it is just what God has promised. I like uh, this one. Uh, the, the, the word of God effectually works in those who believe. This is First Thessalonians 2. And 13, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively works in those who believe. So the Bible says, that'd be a good one to put into your spirit and to tumble over. Or John 17, 17, sanctify them through your tooth. Your word is truth. You go to sleep at night saying, sanctify this young man. John 15, 3, you've already, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Or, or Ephesians 2, 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Or Psalm 119, your word have I hid in my heart. It helps me not sin against you. Here, here's another lie. I'll give you another example. I, I, I struggle with sin, so maybe I'm not saved. I struggle with sin, so maybe I'm not saved. Truth, you're justified by Christ's righteousness, not yours. Bible, for your sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What if a kid went to bed going, I'm struggling with sin, but I am struggling, and Jesus is my righteousness. How freeing would that be? What if he said, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. That would be a good thing to tumble over your mind. How about a woman who lives alone and feels unloved? And she often thinks, there's nobody for me. I'm never going to be loved. I heard a lady say, she told me once, I was lying on the couch. I spent a lot of time lying on the couch alone. And I think, I'm getting old and wrinkly. I'm going to die on this couch, old, wrinkly, and alone. That's what she said. I'm going to die on this couch, old, wrinkly, and lonely. And when she said it, I thought, she's a Christian, and God the Father would not want one of his little girls to think like that. There's a truth that she's missing somewhere. How about if she put in her mind, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in, in the heavenly places. He chose us before him, before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption. You know, what, what parts of these she could tumble in her mind? Uh, through Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, by which he has blessed us in the beloved. What if she tumbled over her riches in Christ? The truth is, she is special to God. The truth is, she has a spiritual gift to give. The truth is, she has fellowship. She can have fellowship with the eternal God. The truth is there are other lonely people that she should minister to. Uh, there, there are all kinds of truths that she could decide that she's going to, she could decide to meditate on Psalm 139. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, there are a lot of old, older people who don't have perfectly unblemished faces who are powerfully used of God. I was in Oregon having a gout attack. 
it was Sunday and I wanted to go to church and it was going to be literally super hard to get there, but I wanted so bad to go to church. My grandkids, Holly and Jesse and Lois and Aiden and Bella were going to be there and I wanted to be in church with them. So I hobble into church and I sit down and I'm just glad I made it. I can't move around and it's really painful and and they start singing and the kids are singing and clapping, the grandkids, it's a happy thing. And I look up at the praise band and, and there's a guy in the praise, <laughs> you remember this, Lois? There's a guy in the praise band and the dude is a character, right? He's got like a long blonde ponytail, really nice long blonde ponytail, hair to be jealous of. <laughs> he was an old guy had on a white Cuba Vera type shirt, real nice looking like white linen shirt on, and jeans and flip flops. And he's in the band playing a harmonica, like Bob Dylan. He's going all Bob Dylan in the praise band. And I just couldn't stop watching this happy guy with the wrinkled old face and a long blonde ponytail doing a Bob Dylan with the, <laughs> with the harmonica uh, uh, in the praise band. It just tickled me. It just thrilled me. I just thought, I'd love to tell that guy, thanks for playing the harmonica today. You were so a blessing to me. But I thought, I can't hobble over there and tell him because it would hurt too bad. I noticed there was a door that I could get out to get to the street and get to the car as quick as I could. But that guy, when he got done, he came off the platform. He just happened to go over there and stand by that door. And on the way out, I said, man, you were such a blessing to me today. And I noticed his face was wrinkled in a permanent smile. And that week, I, call, I talked to the pastor. I go, who's the dude with the harmonica, with the hair and the harmonica? He goes, oh, that guy. Jesus is an old converted hippie. I think he was like an engineer or something, but he was a professional man. And that, but he said, oh, he's just an old converted hippie, and, and that's what he does to be a blessing. Like, he was a blessing to me. I don't know why. I needed to hear somebody to go off Bob Dylan on the harmonica on the praise team that morning. You might be wrinkled, but be a wrinkled blessing. Or you might be lying to yourself and going, I'm just a kid, I can't do anything for God. And you didn't know that passage that says his strength is made perfect in weakness. I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ would rest upon me. There's, a, there's an exciting life out there for you when you start embedding the word of truth in your soul and doing what God says and believing what God says and thinking about what God says because he, Jesus, has a daily word of life for you, but Satan has a daily custom-made lie for you. And lies are everywhere and lies are powerful and lies are dangerous, but we have the living truth of the word of God. Eddie, come pray a blessing. Prayer partners, come stand here in the front. You might need somebody to...